The Dave Carter Show is part of the Ricochet Audio Network run by Ricochet.com. Here's why you should join the Ricochet community. You can write your own post or comment on thousands of other posts on every conceivable topic. Connect with conservatives from across the country and around the world. Ricochet is the home of smart and civil conversation on the web. Join or create your own Ricochet group and interact with others who have the same hobbies, interests, and pursuits. Check it out at ricochet.com slash join. Membership starts at just $4.50 a month, and you'll be supporting podcasts like this one. Go to ricochet.com slash join right now and join the conversation. Storyteller, historian, Hellraiser. It's Dave Carter, and this is the Dave Carter Show. I am Dave Carter. I'm a soldier, historian, and all that other jazz, all that other stuff. But that's not important right now because because it's Christmas time. And as they say back home on the bayou, man, we're going to pass a good time, yeah. We have Ricochet co-founder Peter Robinson, who was also a phenomenal speechwriter for Ronald Reagan with us. Rob Long, also a Ricochet co-founder and the executive producer for the TV show Cheers, has some thoughts to share. A retired military veteran and my friend Bob Lee is in the house. And, oh yeah, we got the Cajun night before Christmas straight ahead. Man, it's good to be back, folks. Uh, my dear friend and uh, co-conspirator Sydney J. Michaels uh, is up to her eyeballs right now in holiday doings and still nursing a bum shoulder from that little accident a while back. So she's not able to uh, to be with us today, and uh, I'm sure you join me in wishing her a speedy recovery and a Merry Christmas to her and her family. And, man, I hope you get to feeling better soon, you whippersnapper. Just uh, relax if you can and enjoy the show here. So uh, here's the thing. We have a lot of ground to cover today, but it's going to be a lot of fun. We have a lot of interesting people to talk to, and the Cajun uh, uh, Christmas tradition will continue and more. And there wouldn't be a whole heck of a lot of time to banter back and forth with a co-host and still get all these other things in. So how about this? How about uh, just you and I settle down for a warm and merry Christmas special? Hmm? So what is your favorite Christmas, uh, what's the right term, libation? What's your favorite Christmas drink? Is it eggnog? I've got a little cup of coffee with me now with some chicory in it. Uh, do you like eggnog with a little something in it? Hot buttered rum, uh, coffee and Irish cream. I kind of wish I could do that, but i got to go to work today. How about hot chocolate? you ever notice how the taste or even the smell of a certain beverage will bring certain memories back to vivid life? For me, it's the smell and taste of hot chocolate, of all things. I was a little guy. When my dad took me to Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge to watch the LSU Tigers in action, he was a student there, and he'd bring me and a thermos of hot chocolate along. I'd wrap my little hands around that hot cup of delicious chocolate in the cold chill, and the effect was instantaneous. All 350 or so members of the band would just about blow me out of the stands with that terrific sound, and I got chills listening to them. Oh, chills that called for more hot chocolate, of course. But Christmas? Ah, Christmas for me, among other things, that's eggnog. I mean, preferably with some smooth southern comfort or bourbon in it, but uh, whatever the drink of your choice or the snack of your choice, let's just relax and hear from some really interesting people, shall we? Dave Carter, this is Rob Long calling to wish you a Merry Christmas, you and your listeners a Merry Christmas. I put off making this recording and sending it until it actually started to snow. So I'm looking out my front window. The snow is falling. New York City is looking particularly beautiful and Christmassy. And um, my, my Christmas wish and New Year's wish to you and your listeners is to remember, as I try to remember every day, that we are all going to be okay. That no matter what we see on television, no matter what we see on the news, no matter what we see on Twitter, that's not real life. Uh, the snow falling outside my window is real life. Christmas is real life. And um, I wish you the very best for 2020. Thank you, 
Rob. Merry Christmas to you and yours, sir. You know, folks, on a very important level, uh, I think Rob is right. Of course, what happens at the seat of power is important and always is. The reality of it hits us most every year at April 15th, right square in the wallet, right? But I think Rob puts his finger on something when he reminds us uh, at this time of year especially that real life isn't necessarily found in the fever-pitched accusations and 24-7 news-provoked outrage machine that hopes, indeed, really requires us to nod our heads in universal agreement with whatever affront they've cooked up for us uh, next. It isn't worth losing important relationships over. And I speak of someone who has spent over 35 years now weighing in on all sorts of issues and columns and essays and speeches and such. And I speak as someone who has, to my eternal shame, uh, jeopardized friendships over political issues and questions that at the end of the day will always be with us in one form or another. The relationship of the individual to the state, uh, that's part of the human drama. And the human drama remains, but we don't. Which is yet another reason why I took a step back with this program to broaden our purpose and seek quite simply to share a smile and a laugh while getting to know some truly interesting people. So yes, the falling snow, our favorite Christmas songs, our family friendships and our faith, our children and grandchildren, they are, to use Rob's words, real life, yes? So hold them a little tighter, um, hug them a little longer, and let them know how much they mean to you. I'm drawn inevitably, it seems, uh, when I talk about things like this, to my years on active duty, where hearth and home were literally half a world away, and the significance just simply cannot be overemphasized of what, of what that feels like. And who better to talk to and laugh with about all things military than a fellow veteran, right? So, those of you who've been listening to this program uh, for a couple of years or so will uh, likely remember my next guest, Technical Sergeant Robert E. Lee, U.S. Air Force, retired, is more than a colleague. He's a, He was the gentleman that recruited me into the historian career field some 32 years ago. He was a teacher, a mentor, and to this day, he's a dear friend. Now, with a name like Robert E. Lee, you might think he served in the Civil War, um, but... Of course, uh, you'd, you'd be right. Actually, it was Bob who helped out uh, as a ghostwriter for Thucydides on the subject of the Peloponnesian misunderstanding. And, of course, who can forget his history-making remark when he asked Napoleon, quote, perchance has your has seen Moscow in winter, unquote. Of course, he had aged just a little by the time that I met him uh, for the first time back in 1987. He had a bottle of Maalox in one hand, a cigarette in the other hand, and he was drinking one and puffing on the other and thoroughly embalmed from his most recent tour of duty in Korea, where he single-handedly kept the soju market and his liver afloat. Uh, <laughs> I remember halfway through our initial conversation in his office about the possibility or the, even the desirability of me becoming a military historian. And Bob looked at me and said, and I quote, Dave, there are three things that I keep forgetting. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, then he took a snort from the Maalox bottle and talked about something else. So, so it's obviously a treat uh, to welcome a guy who is, in all candor, uh, lifting up a bottle right now over Skype. What, what do you <laughs> – what is that? Black – black what? Black bush. Is that that's whiskey or scotch or what? Rye. <laughs> Irish whiskey. Okay. Oh, man. Anyway, um, like I said, he's a gentleman, right? Drinking is not even 10 o'clock yet. And uh, one of the smartest people I've ever had, I've ever known. Bob, obviously, I was going to ask how you're doing, but you must be doing pretty damn good now since you're already hoisting a bottle by the time we just start this thing. So, Well, I always was a bottle baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's going to be one of those conversations, isn't it? Um, for the benefit of... I'm going to see you know, how many times I can have you go to confession. <laughs> for cussing? <laughs> anyway, uh, for, uh, for the benefit of folks who perhaps haven't heard you before, how long were you on active duty? Uh, let's see. 21 years, 7 months, and 21 days. Um. But who can? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and you were stationed. I know you were stationed in Korea. What, 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 what were the countries that you were, were stationed or, or deployed to? If you can remember, uh, you moved around a lot. Yeah, I, I was in Korea twice. I was in uh, 
Saudi Arabia, uh, it's in the Philippines. Uh, I was in uh, North Dakota, that's South not, Dakota. Well, that's a, that's, yeah, that's not the same. That, that's a, that's the same country. I think. No, those are two different countries. You were in, you were in Louisiana, <laughs> so I know that was a different country. <laughs> yeah, still is. Uh, speaking of which, uh, tornado blew through Alexandria yesterday. Yeah, I looked at some of the photos from that, and I think that it hit the chapel and the old club on on uh, Old England Air Force Base. Post. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. I looked at that those photos. I thought, man, that's 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 the chapel, and the 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 officers' club was right next to it, wasn't it? Well, that was no loss. Well, well, I get that, but, you know, <laughs> stop it. Yeah. <laughs> just stop it, God. Yeah. But um, the, uh, yeah, I, I, it was bad going through there. There were some good memories of England, yeah. not just bad. Right. The bad memories were of uh, profit. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> what would it profit us to go through all that, right? So, um. <laughs> So, so you were in for 21 years. So that's a lot of Christmases, obviously. Uh, yeah. During that time that you were on active duty, is, is there is there a, a Christmas while you were on active duty that stands out for one reason or another? Oh, Lord, they all stood out. Uh, <laughs> Christmas is away. Christmas is at home. Uh, I had a, my, my... The Christmas... The Christmas in Saudi Arabia was interesting. Yeah, uh, I did that. I deployed in uh, October for Saudi Arabia, and the uh, and the uh, family packed my Christmas gifts in my uh, duffel bag. Yeah, and they did not tell me mm-hmm. that they had packed those gifts. In my duffel bag. So any, any issue with I'm Saudi customs? Queued, I'm queued up at customs, <laughs> and they're going, yeah, "Do you have anything to declare?" And I'm unpacking my duffel bag, and all these packages start coming out, Pizza. and I have no idea what they are. <laughs> Fortunately, I was the last one through, and he was tired after 500 other people, and I literally de- 500 other people. I declare people, I didn't pack and these he packages. Just Wave me on through. <laughs> you know they they uh, uh, that when I went through Saudi customs they they cut they confiscated our icebreakers chewing gum because in the ingredients on the back of the of the pack of gum it says that it contains alcohol and they didn't want us getting drunk off the chewing gum. However, yes. we were allowed to have um, uh, Nyquil for medicinal yes. purposes. Ain't nobody got a cold while we were there. They were doing Nyquil shots every night, so. The healthiest deployment I'd ever seen. It was it was a long, strange trip. Yeah, man. Uh, now, um, uh, your dad was on active duty. Uh, yes, retired, right? So, how many? How, yes. You were one of how many kids in the uh, in, in in the household there? Uh, six. When my dad was in in service. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Peter Robinson a variation of this question uh, in a little bit, but uh, are there any Christmas traditions for the Lee family that have continued to your household today back from those times? Opening Christmas, opening presents on Christmas Eve. Okay. I've seen a couple families that do that. Yes, so, we, uh, antsy kids, <laughs> mm-hmm. they... Uh, they decided as wise parents just to wear us out on Christmas Eve so that <laughs> mom and dad could sleep on Christmas Day. Okay, yeah, okay. I, I've I've heard of that. I've seen it done a couple, in a couple of different families, but okay, cool. Um, so you, you you spent some Christmases away from your family, and, and uh, I, I I did too. Uh, my, my the the Christmas memory that stands out the most for me from being on active duty was the one in basic training, and that's where the TI came in at five thirty and uh, said "ho effing ho," and kicked garbage <laughs> cans and screamed like and it's like it was any other day of the week. So you know, then you try to pass all this stuff off when you're away from home. It's just that you know it's the cost of what you do. It's part of the business, and you press on. But ne- I never really could quite fool myself, you know. It's always a downer. Um, 
So am I correct in assuming that being away from home during the holidays was an especially acute issue to work through for you as well, or were, or were you able to slough it off and press on? No, I was able to press on, but you couldn't slough it off. Uh, but the military did try. Uh, I always loved the Christmas meals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the military did try, and the Christmas, the holiday meals. Right. Everything from soup to nuts, literally. Uh, those were my favorites. I know in, in Korea, they did the neatest thing. Of course, we had a big Thanksgiving feast. I was gone for Christmas, and I came back to the States uh, that when I was over there for Christmas break. But, uh, you know, they did a great big feast on Thanksgiving. They had a neat, neat little deal they did at Kunsan Air Base where they would uh, – every month they'd have a birthday meal at the chow hall. If, you, if your birthday was within yep. in that yep. month, you signed up. And here's the wing commander and the group commanders and the squadron commanders all uh, decked out in whatever they, you know, little jumpsuit dealies. And they were they were serving the food, you know, steak and lobster. And uh, it was really, really nice. So, and you could bring a guest, you know. You remember when you and I did the podcast with my friend uh, Pat Murphy? Yeah. And he was stationed in Korea with me, and I brought him as as my guest. And we, they, they served wine and steak and lobster, and we really had a good time. So when they were able to, they really did do as much as they could to lend some taste of home, uh, you know, some ambiance of something comfortable and enjoyable for the for the troops over there. So that was nice, yeah. Well, you had it more difficult down at uh, at Kunsan, uh, but you had a different situation down there at yeah, Kunsan. We're, we're on the coast. There, there. It's not a company. Nobody brings their family. You get off the little the plane, and they shuttle you on the bus. You get off the bus, and you get your Kim gear issued. And uh, cool, I yeah. got I got there in uh, summer of '94 when Bill Clinton was thinking very seriously about uh, pursuing sanctions in the UN. To which uh, Kim Il Sung was was the, uh, the, the gargoyle in chief then in Korea, and he said that if they do that, it's an act of war. And so we took it seriously. We were carrying flight vest and Kim gear and every, everywhere we went on base with us because it was it was you know high adventure as they say. Yeah, I was at, at Osan and and the uh, and uh, the biggest danger there was falling off a bar stool. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you can walk off the ba- off the base right outside the gate. I mean, it's just Disneyland for drunks right there. Kunsan, right outside the base gates, it was all um, off limits. Well, we st- so we still had uh, we still had the uh, <clears throat> occasional intruders trying to come on. Uh, uh, the uh, most folks don't realize that the war's still going on over there. Right. And the uh, the North Koreans are still sending special forces to the south to see whatever mischief they can get into. Yeah, it's a ceasefire. Yeah. It's a ceasefire. It hasn't – so it's not yeah. – technically, it's, it's not ended yet. Um, uh, speaking of uh, – of uh, Korea, they just ended the curfew. Really? At Osan? At Osan. Huh. Okay. Yeah, they still had that going when I was there. Yeah, well, they've had it going since 1953, <laughs> so they just ended it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we were. We, we had the, uh, the, the, uh, the PACAF uh, Historians Conference at Osan, and uh, <laughs> yeah, that was. That's, I'm not going to tell a whole lot of stories from that. No. But oh. if you recall, the, the the shops where they sold the uh, the jackets and the blankets and all that stuff were on the yes. first floor. The second floor of these buildings were the bar, and they, it was open air. You know, they had no glass in the windows. It's just, it just open yeah. air. And so we Why were bother with the glass. The GIs would just break right, it. Right. Anyway. Exactly. Yeah. So we were sitting in this one bar, and uh, the the. Poor the folks over there, the, the locals, what they knew of English, they learned from GIs. And so that was that was rather unfortunate. They had a, a sign hanging out the bar that advertised this is the best effing rock and roll in town. And they thought that was a perfectly acceptable word because everybody, all the GIs used it, you know. So we were yeah. sitting in that bar to listen to some rock and roll. And it was, it was tur- curfew time. So it's time to leave. And there had been, you know, the little uh, carts with the fried whatever's that they that they serve yeah. you know yeah it was, I across love the, those. it was across the street and there was this lady 
a working lady, and she, uh, she, older lady, and she had been staring at me. Uh, I was up on the second floor with some other historians <laughs> laughing, and they were laughing at the fact that she was staring at me, and she did this little maneuver with a Coke bottle and a straw to try to get my attention in terms of what, in, <laughs> and uh, I just like, I don't want to, no, 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 I'm not even going to look. Of course, I don't have to. They're all telling me. And our hotel, we've got to walk right in front of her, you know, to get to the hotel and thinking, oh, God, no, this is not going to be good. So I told them, just just walk around me like a Secret Service detail, please, I, you know. And so as soon as we got to her, they all backed away so that they were. <laughs> and she told me. What she, are friends for? Yeah, that's right. And she said, you look like a gentleman's. I know how to take care of gentlemen's. Well, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to go. I'm going to the hotel now. Goodbye. So, yeah, great memories. Great memories. Uh, how did all that come up? Never mind. Let's first press on. God. <laughs> Let me go to confession well, again. Well, I, I learned to deal with, with the ladies. Uh, they would come up to me. Now. My name is Lee. Here we go. Uh, they would uh, they would say, you know, the mama sons would come up and go, "Would you like nice young yes, lady?" Yes. And I'd go, no, no. Uh, uh, "Mama son." I'm going to start drinking Miss, here in a minute. Miss Lee would cut my chaji off mm. if <clears throat> I mess with any of your girls, and they would be thinking that I had a. A local lady named Miss Lee. Right. Because everybody over there is named Miss Lee, Miss Kim, or right. Miss Joe. Yeah. And they'd, they'd go, oh, okay, no problem. They'd leave you alone, then. And, and point of fact, Miss Lee <laughs> would actually cut my job. Because you know, Miss Lee is. And them girls. <laughs> and Miss Lee I was, just didn't let her know it was my wife. Your lovely and long suffering wife. I've known for many. <laughs> yes, she absolutely would. Uh, so, last question here. Um, you're going to, and I just no right or wrong answer. I'm just morbid curiosity. You're going to make any New Year's resolutions this year? Actually, uh, I'm not even waiting to New Year's. I've got uh, 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 several resolutions, and uh, the main one, I guess, is being I'm writing more. Oh, good. I'm trying to get back into writing. Good. Uh, nothing in particular, just. Putting pen to paper and letting whatever come out. Good. I need to. Uh, but yeah. Diary of the ink. Well, it's, it's 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 just it's, it's sitting at a, a blank piece of paper and it's bleeding. You that's know, it. The soul speaks and the mind. So that's good. Well, my friend, uh, as always, Bob, it's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you for taking the time to, to uh, chat with us. And share some insights and some uh, <clears throat> enjoyable and questionable stories. I <laughs> yeah, you are definitely going to have to put the stories we talk about before you turn the recorder on. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. And, well, and I haven't even brought up the chicken stories, you know. So, oh, well, I but, mean, but you know, and the stories, the stories that the, uh, the I'm sure the FBI will be understanding, and your priest will just, eventually. Just, just forgive shut you. up. God, just shut up. <laughs> Merry Christmas, you old jerk. No, 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 no. <laughs> and a happy New Year yeah. to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Tell tell the family uh, hello. Give them my love, please. Okay. Merry Christmas to you, brother. And tell Shelly and everybody there we love you. All right, we love you too. Take care of my buddy Bob Lee on the Dave Carter program. <laughs> The Dave Carter Show on Ricochet. Oh, Bob Lee, man. 
Yeah. What a guy. You know, I, and uh, I mean, I've known him forever, since roughly after the earth cooled. I love him like a brother, but um, you just never know which way the conversation is going to go with him. That's part of the fun. That's part of the uh, suspense, I guess. And uh, we tease each other relentlessly. But, uh, man, he's, he's a super, super guy and uh, love him to death. You know, I was talking with Bob. It reminded me of uh, the Christmas uh, of 2000. Now, not to sound morose here, uh, but to illustrate the sentiments uh, that deployed troops often have, particularly at the holidays, I was in uh, at Prince Sultan uh, Air Base in Saudi Arabia for Christmas of 2000, and uh, it was Christmas Eve. I was writing dispatches back home to uh, to friends and the family. Christmas Eve, uh, I wrote the following um, Quote, the thought occurred during our little Christmas lighting ceremony last week that we're not very far from the place where the stars shone on that first Christmas, an area so ravaged by death and destruction this year that the annual celebration in Bethlehem has been all but canceled. But the dream of peace, real peace, endures, yes? And believe me, no one wishes for peace more than those who must be prepared to fight. Our commander, Brigadier General Peck, spoke to us at the ceremony. One of the things he shared with us was a poem that was written by one of our own commanders here. The poem so perfectly uh, captures the spirit of things here right now. And because it says so artfully the thoughts that I am trying so clumsily to put on paper for you, I'll let the poem finish this Christmas dispatch. The poem is called A Christmas Wish. The desert moon hangs full and bright, or Arab sands on our Christmas night. As far from home our watch we stand, a silent night, on foreign land. In quiet rooms or lonely post, we listen for that Christmas ghost, of times gone by, of Christmas past, of trees and wreaths and loves held fast. Oh, to be home and loved tonight, t'would make our weary hearts feel light to drink a toast and light the tree and watch our young ones laugh with glee. But duty calls without fanfare, no martial tunes, no trumpets blare, just moonlit dunes and dust and sand and lonely vigils that we stand. With heads held high and honor proud, our purpose firm, our hearts unbowed, our mission clear, our vision sure, protect our values, our rights secure. We seek no medals, no reviews, but shall make sure that peace ensues. We're unassuming warriors all who've answered to our nation's call. A Christmas wish we ask again for peace on earth, goodwill to men. The Christmas wish we wish for you is for your wishes to come true. Those words uh, they moved us to tears that night, and um, and the emotions and memories that they are evoking even now are as strong and sometimes as raw as they were back then. Anyway, we made it back home. Well, we didn't all make it back home, um, but this program shouldn't turn maudlin now, should it? There's so much here to celebrate, so much to enjoy. It came at a high price, but it's certainly worth the effort. A good gumbo would be nice about right now, I think, don't you? Uh, or maybe some boudin or some couscous. I remember the old LSU Tigers cheer that we'd yell during the games. Hot boudin, cold couscous. Come on, Tigers. Push, push, push. Uh, yeah, I'm making myself homesick for the bayou now. But I've got just the thing to help. All right, here now with a little touch of bayou country is my little jug-eared Cajun friend Alphonse Fontenot with the Cajun... As I was trying to say... No, 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 you be quiet, Dwee. Look, why why are you all cramming in here now, have again? you settled down for just half a second, Larry, and stop getting your panties in a knot for once, we just want to be a part of this fine Christmas tradition here and watch our friend Alphonse tell his Christmas story. Oh, okay. Well, now that you put it that way, let's just go ahead. That's enough out of you. Now, where's Alphonse? Me, I'm over here. Well, that's not helping anyone over there. Come here, Whistle Bridges. Okay. Get your butt up here. Yeah, got better? That's fine, Alice. That's fine. Okay, Larry, hit it. This is how you call that Cajun night before Christmas. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, they don't a thing pass, not even a mouse. 
The children been nestled good snug on the floor. And mama passed the pepper to the crack on the door. The mom in the fireplace done roast up the ham, stir up the gumbo, and make back the yam. Then out on the bayou, they got such a clatter. Who makes sound like a boudreau done fall off his ladder. I'd run like a rabbit to got to the door, trip over the dog, and uh, fall on the floor. As I look out the door in the light of the moon, I think, Man, you crazy, or got old too soon. Cause there out on the bayou, when I stretch my neck stiff, there's eight alligator pulling a skiff. With a little fat drover with a long polling stick, I know right away got to be old St. Nick. More faster and faster the gator they came, and he whistled and hollered and called him by name. Ah, Gaston, that's your boy, Pierre and I'll see, Zinanet, Zizuzet, Celeste and Rene. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Make crawl out of gator, then be sure you don't fall. Like tent floors catch to the treetop he fly, when the big old hondo come and run himself by. Like get up the porch, the old gator climb, with a skiff full of toy and St. Nicholas behind. Then on top of the porch roof, it sound like the hail, when all them big gator done sat down their tail. Then down the chimney I yell, with a bam, St. Nicholas fall, and sit on the yam. So cray, he exclaimed, my pant got a hole. I done set myself on them red hot coal. He got on his foot and jumped like a cat out to the floor where he land with a splat. He was dressed in muskrat from his head to his foot and his clothes is all dirty with ashes and soot. A sack full of plaything he throw on his back and he looked like a burglar and that's for a fact. His eyes how they shine, his dimple how merry. Maybe he been drink the wine from Blackberry. His cheek like rose, his nose like a cherry. And on second thought, maybe he lap up the sherry. With snow white chin whisker and quivering belly that shook when he laughed like this strong berry jelly. But a wink of his eye and a shook of his head make my comfort say that I don't got to be scared. He don't do no talking, gone straight to his work, put plaything in sock and then turn with the jerk. Then he put both his hands there on top of his head, cast an eye on the chimney and then he done said... With all that fire and them burning hot flame, <laughs> me, I ain't going back by the same way that I came. So he ran out the porch and jumped to the roof. He ain't no fool him for to make one more goof. He jumped in his skiff and cracked his big whip, and the gator moved down and don't make one slip. And I hear him shout loud as I splash and he go, Merry Christmas to all. Till I see you some more. Good work, guys. Very good work. And uh, Merry Christmas. That's Alphonse Fontenot, Ross Perot, and General Hatchet on the Dave Carter Program. Alphonse is unleashed like that, does things like that. It's a lot of fun. Now, here's a little story that uh, you may be interested in. I first heard The Cajun Night Before Christmas uh, shortly after its first publication in 1973. I was in sixth grade, I think, and it was either uh, Grandma Carter who read it or perhaps it was uh, Aunt D, uh, another relative of ours. But whoever it was, we all gathered around the... Uh, the uh, chair and she read i think it was aunt d actually anyway she kept having to stop while she was reading it to wipe the tears from her eyes because she was laughing so much i mean we all more we all were laughing because you could actually hear various people in our family and friends and acquaintances talking like that and telling stories like that it was actually pretty true to the kinds of things that we told and with that we laughed at 
And here it was in book form. It was amazing. This was actually, this book was actually the brainchild of one J.B. Kling, Jr., a retired law enforcement officer in Baton Rouge. Its uh, first iteration was as a Christmas message from the Bergeron Plymouth Company of New Orleans. And the story eventually won a Clio Award from the Academy of uh, Television and Radio Advertising in 1967. And it went on from that point eventually to be published in book form. Well, sir, when I heard that thing the first time, I immediately asked for a copy of the book, and I was given one, and in short order, at I guess 12 or 13 years old, I memorized the thing just effortlessly, totally naturally. The accent, of course, came naturally, and it has been stuck in my head ever since. I couldn't get it out of my head if I wanted to, although I don't, but I've remembered it all these years. My maternal grandmother, uh, my mother's mom, we called her Granny Bob, she used to say, David Ben, you can memorize the most useless stuff there is. I just wish for once you could memorize your schoolwork half as easily. And she was right. And uh, here we are. I've dressed up in Cajun garb and recited that thing for church groups in the mountains of North Georgia when I was a teenager, also down in Valdosta, Georgia, and various homes and parties and gatherings over the air, of course, because to this day, it rings true to life, like the stories and jokes that I heard growing up. Sometimes words move us to laugh, which puts things in sort of a good perspective, right? It kind of makes everything fall into place a little bit easier and we can smile. And sometimes... Words can change history, which brings us to another interesting conversation with a gentleman whose words helped change the course of history. And finally, Peter Robinson, he is a fellow of the Hoover Institution and author and former speechwriter for President Ronald Reagan. Peter recommended a good line on a desirable future for the Berlin Wall back in 1987 to President Reagan. Most important at this point is to note that uh, two years ago under the auspices of Hoover, he launched a half-hour television show called Uncommon Knowledge. It's very, very good. I hope that the station managers and program managers will agree with me uh, on this and uh, uh, listen in and perhaps give them an opportunity to proceed. That voice, that distinctive voice, was, of course, that of William F. Buckley, Jr., whose program was appointment television in the Carter household. And in that snippet at the outset of his final Firing Line episode in 1999, Bill Buckley introduced Mr. Peter Robinson to, well, me, and I assume a great many other folks as well. And, of course, the relevant people did, in fact, give Peter an opportunity to proceed. As a matter of fact, the reason I'm talking to you folks now is because Peter gave me an opportunity to proceed for which I'll be eternally grateful. For those of you who don't know, Mr. Robinson is a graduate of Dartmouth University, after which he attended Oxford University, where he earned a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics, later graduated from Stanford University, uh, graduate school of business with a master's in business administration. He was a speechwriter for then-Vice President George H.W. Bush, eventually becoming a speechwriter for President Ronald Reagan, authoring over 300 speeches, including Reagan's 1987 speech in Berlin, including the line, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He's the author of a few books, How Ronald Reagan Changed My Life, quite simply a beautiful, inspiring book. He also wrote It's My Party, a Republican's love, Messy Love Affair with the GOP. And then there's the book I haven't read yet, but the title suggests that I really ought to. It's called Snapshots from Hell, The Making of an MBA. Uh, at first I thought it might be a glimpse into retail work, but it's a pleasure <laughs> indeed to welcome him to the program. Peter, how are you, sir? I'm just fine, Dave. All the better for talking to you. Um, My goodness, it was good to hear Bill Buckley's voice again. I uh, that that let me see that that was that was twenty. Oh my goodness, twenty years ago, 1999 yeah, yeah. is the year he ended the run of Firing Line and recorded that final show. Oh my gosh, I hadn't, yeah, I hadn't done the math, but yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you, Dave. Um, I, I briefly mentioned just a couple of your accomplishments, uh, chiefly because there's not enough time to go through the whole list, I don't think. But Uh-oh. am I correct uh, that the path to your becoming a speechwriter and a special assistant to President Reagan uh, pretty much started with your friendship with William F. Buckley Jr.? Uh, you're entirely correct about that. Um, I uh, I went to Dartmouth College, as you mentioned, and I was a student journalist there. And Bill Buckley, great man, great journalist, 
how he found time to do half of what he did, I do not know. Right, but in yeah. addition to all his own professional occupations, he paid pretty close attention to student journalism. And so I wrote a couple of conservative opinion pieces for the Dartmouth uh, College newspaper, the Daily Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And Bill noticed them. Bill. I say Bill. Right. Years later, he became Bill to me. Mr. Sure. Buckley noticed them. Sure. And we struck up a uh, Something of a friendship through sheerly through his generosity with his time. He always answered letters. Uh, he always did whatever he could. He was just an, an exceptionally generous person. I went from Dartmouth to Oxford. I studied at Oxford for two years and stayed in England for a third year to write a novel. And at the end of that year, I had produced most of a novel, but it was so bad that even I couldn't stand to read it. <laughs> and, um, I find that hard to believe. So I, but okay. Oh, no, no, no. Truly. Be take, believe, take my word on that one. <laughs> and I wrote to everybody I could think of who might be able to give me some bead on a job, including Bill Buckley, who was one of the very, very few who bothered to write back. Uh -huh. And Bill said simply, you like writing. And you like politics, you ought to go to Washington and see if you can become a speechwriter. This was 1982. Okay. And he said, when you're in Washington, get in touch with my son, Christopher, Christopher Buckley, who was then writing speeches for Vice President Bush. So I followed Bill's directions. I got in touch with Christopher. This is July 1982. I strolled into the office, the vice president's office and what was then called the old executive office building right next to the White House. Mm -hmm. And I hoped that Christopher might be able to recommend me for a speech writing job for some member of Congress or a cabinet officer. And instead, Christopher announced that he was leaving his job as speechwriter to the vice president mm -hmm. in just a couple of weeks and that his replacement, who'd been lined up for a good long time, had just fallen through. And he couldn't see any good reason why I shouldn't be a speechwriter to the vice president myself. Wow. So I tumbled. I was I found out later that they hired me as a kid because they needed somebody in a hurry and they eventually were going to hire somebody more senior to oversee me and hmm. be a serious presence in the office. And uh, but George Bush and I simply hit it off. And it turned out speechwriting is not a high art. It's a knack. Mm -hmm. Um some people can do, do Cajun accents like my friend Dave Carter. Some people can impersonate, oh, I don't know, Jimmy Carter or Jimmy Jimmy Stewart. I'm showing my age wow. now. Some people can do impersonations and some people can write speeches. And I just happen to be one of those who could. So between being able to write speech, which was a which was a darn lucky thing because I didn't know that until I got hired. Nobody even asked to see a writing sample. And wow. I've never written a speech in my life. Yeah. In any event, it was because of Bill making a suggestion and then – luck that I happened to it was a set of flukes but Bill was the one who set them all in motion okay um you know a few minutes ago when I was introducing you I referred to you as sir and it reminded me that you the, did yeah don't, don't oh, you go back and edit that out well I'm but not, not, I don't I don't I'm not up to that I don't want to because I want to remind you of our <laughs> very first conversation on the phone when I came out of the starting gate and called you sir and you said that if I was going to start that business, you would have to reciprocate since I'd been uh, in the military. And I said I wouldn't want to inflict that on anybody. So we dropped all the sir stuff. There we go. And I remember talking with you and uh, Rob Long, where you gentlemen were kind enough to offer me an opportunity to be a contributor at Ricochet and join the ranks of now, other hold, people. Hold, I have to stop you right there. Yeah. On a good day, yeah. I might almost be a gentleman. But Rob? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's in the acting business, right? So. That's right. <laughs> But I mean, I, I was, he, you guys told me that I'd be joining the ranks of people like uh, Governor uh, Mitch Daniels from Indiana, Victor Davis Hanson. Folks, I've been reading for years and years, and I told you that this is pretty heady stuff and that I was just little old me. And I'll never forget what you said. You said, and I quote, Dave, we're all just a bunch of little old us's. Remember that? I don't remember I that. Do. I hope you're not making this up. Because no, because that, it totally that was a pretty good comeback. It was, it was, yeah, it was stellar. But it totally put me at ease. You know that I okay, this that I could actually maybe pull this off. Now, when you were in the White House or having dinner with uh, Bill Buckley and his family and his star-studded list of guests, uh, and later your friendship, uh, for example, with uh, uh, Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize-winning yes. economist, among uh, many other folks. Did you ever look around at the people that were surrounding you and wonder, you know, gee whiz, how, how the hell did this happen? Did that ever, did that ever happen? Or were you it so busy did. that you didn't it, have well, time what to do happened, 
the the way I got over it, mm-hmm. I can remember that this I can remember vividly. All my time in the White House was years and years and years ago now. Right. But I do remember that was very heady. I was 25 years old when I started in the White House. I was what was I was 27 when I joined. I went from Vice President Bush's staff to President Reagan's staff. And I can still remember my first meeting with President Reagan. We speechwriters walked into the Oval Office. Now, this will sound ridiculous, Mm -hmm. but I have to tell you the words that formed in my mind as I walked in and saw him, Ronald Reagan, seated at the desk in the Oval Office. The words that formed in my mind were, but he's just a man. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I, I some I don't know what I was expecting, but I was certainly in awe of the office, and I was certainly in awe of Ronald Reagan. Sure. And then I walked in, and he was a man. He he was uh, what would he have been? He was in his early seventies. He was an older man. He was gentlemanly. He was soft spoken, but he was just a man, a mortal, and. A mortal. That's the way yeah. to put it. Yeah. That's the way to put it. I wasn't thinking in such poetic terms, but he was certainly just a mortal. And so being in the White House, discovering that this man who'd been a famous film star and was now president of the United States was just a mortal, kind of got me over the awe that I would otherwise have yeah. felt yeah. at a lot of people. Now, there was – I took – Bill and I, Bill Buckley and I got to know each other really well in 19, the winter of, yes, it was the winter of 87 to 88. He was working on a book and he asked if I could take a leave of absence from the White House to go work with him in Switzerland for a couple of months. Well, a, a couple of months was asking a lot at the White House, but it turned out I had that much vacation time stacked up. Oh, okay. Uh, I, which, which was the technical – the bureau, my boss, the chief speechwriter, wasn't thrilled about uh, – he was mighty unhappy. But, but then Bill said, well, would it help if I wrote a letter to the president – just dropped a line to the president? I mean, was, all the objections stuff. So couldn't, the point is I hurt. took I, – yeah, I took two months off and went over to Switzerland and worked with him. And we started work on a, on a book that became On the Firing Line, his book about his yeah. show, yeah, Firing Line. And we, he rented a chateau, a, a modest castle in Switzerland, <laughs> and we worked out in the basement. And he had his desk. It was a big basement, yeah. 20 feet away from me, and my desk, and I was facing him. And for two or three days, I kept looking up from my work and looking at him. He was working on other matters. He'd be taking phone calls, writing a column, this or that. And I'd think to myself, wait a moment, that's William F. Buckley. That's Mm -hmm. the man I watched on television when I was a kid. But we would spend 10, 11, 12 hours together a day for a month. We got to know each other very well, in particular because (laughs) these stories go on. That (laughs) year, there was a water main on Park Avenue in Manhattan that burst and flooded the Buckleys apartment, Mm, which was a ground floor, a maisonette, as it was called, for a ground floor apartment on Park Avenue. And Pat Buckley, Mrs. Buckley, Mm -hmm. stayed back in New York for three weeks to get it sorted out. And so Bill and I, it was Bill and me in a castle (laughs) with a cook and a, but it it was the two of us. So we, we were together 10, 12 hours a day. We would work several hours together in the morning. Then came lunch. Then we would go skiing together. Then came another working session. And then came dinner, and then another late working session. And so go up, spend time with this man, ski lifts, and he also let it be known. The generosity was just unbelievable. Mm. He also let it be known in Gestad, Switzerland, which had quite a social scene, that when he was invited anywhere, he would be appreciative of the invitation extended to me, his young assistant. Mm -hmm. So I found myself having lunch with Roger Moore, 007 and <laughs> yeah. James, James Clavell, the author of Shogun mm-hmm. and on and on this. I, we had dinner one evening and I was one of seven people at a round table. And one of the other seven people was the former king of Greece. Mm. And that was Bill, Bill Buckley's world. And I was just welcomed into it. And, you know, at the end of eight weeks, 
when you're spending that time with Bill himself and with a great author, James Clavell, and with a former king, and you realize they're all just mortals. Right, right. Uh, it sort of helps you get over it. Sure. Oh, my goodness. Um, so we are just, we are all just yeah. little old lusses. Okay. All right. Well, and well spoken. Uh, now, with your kind permission, we're going to avoid the world of politics like it was of the plague. And uh, talk it about it is the plague, talk, right? Thank you. Right. Talk about some Christmas. It is, it is the plague. <laughs> it won't go away, right? Uh, we keep trying to avoid it, but it won't avoid us. Uh, but we're we're on the final stretch toward Christmas, so I have to ask: with all the favorite uh, tri- Christmas traditions that people have, you know, family gatherings to their favorite stuff to kick up the eggnog and a notch or two, uh, various kinds of food or whatever. Or what are some of your favorite Christmas traditions that you remember that have carried forward? Oh, I, I, I can remember. <laughs> this is a terrible thing to say, but the first, <laughs> there's a tradition that I'm so happy is over. My <laughs> father, before we would open the gifts under the tree, he would put on a record of Enzio Pinza. Is that the name? His name? He was the uh, fame. He was an op. Uh, he was a tenor. I couldn't tell you. I don't and, know. And he would, and my father would make, and the whole family, we were supposed to sing the Lord's Prayer along with this record <laughs> of the tenor. And it was, first of all, it was impossible. <laughs> it was impossible to stick with him. And it seemed it to last. like a commercial for Duluth underwear. What's that? It's, it seemed to last half an hour. And yeah. so I, that's one thing I'm. I, my family and I do not do. So what is the tra- the tradition here? Uh, I, we still, our youngest, we have five kids. Our youngest is now 17. She'll be turning 18 next month. Okay. But the youngest member of the family is still the one who hands out the gifts oh, on Christmas morning. that's cool. Decides who gets what. Um, I'm trying to think what else the... The food, of course, we take so much of it for granted at this stage. Mm-hmm. Actually, and this is a tricky bit because the older kids are really older now. My oldest is 28. I've got four kids in their 20s, and our youngest turns 18 soon. And so don't play this podcast any place here in Northern California, will you please, before sure. Christmas? I'll, we'll so erect the, a wall. We'll build a wall. Mexico will pay for it. We'll okay. build a wall. So the, right, the boys, I, I just I bought a Lego set for the boys. They're in their 20s, but I just – because I got a great deal on a 900-piece Lego set <laughs> because they like to spend Christmas morning being little boys. They right. still like to monkey around with Legos. But the the truth is the gifts, the things that they want have become beyond my – so my youngest son is working back in Boston, and he has announced that he wants to play hockey, wants to learn – he grew up in California. He can't skate, but he's going <laughs> to learn to skate. He wants to play hockey, All right. and he wants a pair of hockey skates for Christmas. So I went online. It turns out there are you can spend from ninety bucks to a thousand bucks on hockey skates. I don't understand the difference, and the and I'm not going to spend give them a gift worth a thousand dollars. So for the kids, we're, I hate to say it, but Legos. we're just going to give each a check, give them some money, okay. and let them spend it on what they want to spend it on. It's harder when the kids get older. Sure, I have found. Yeah, and that that way you know you can't go wrong because they're going to get what what they want. That's right. That's right. It that, feels it doesn't feel quite right, but still, it's the, the best we can figure out how, what to do, how to do. We do that more. So all the, all the creativity now goes into the stockings. Just the little gifts are the fun things. Right. Yeah. Um, I talked with. What do you what about you? Do you have a Christmas gumbo? Oh you, well, I did when my grandmother was with us, but not anymore. Um, right. Oh yeah. See, I, at this point, uh, I'm mean, of course my wife and I have our own. Uh, Traditions. Her family has traditions here, and I'm, I kind of glom on to it. One of the things that they do is uh, they throw the doors open every year, uh, all day long and into the evening, and it's an open house. So oh, that's lovely. Pe- people want to come in. They can. We There was a, a gentleman, Father Martell, who used to be uh, uh, the, the pastor at our church, and he loves black olives. And so he would show up, and he would just plop down on the floor, have some black olives, and then just take a nap because he was running all over the place all the time. <laughs> Really? Yeah. So Father Martel shows up and passes out on the floor with next to his bowl of black olives, and he's happy. And it's just kind of people that, go and come as like they want, that. and you know. Well, that's the South. We, 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 my wife and I both grew up in the Northeast, 
and you don't have an open house right. in the Northeast because it's, typically it's a cold, cold day where I grew up quite far north in New York. It was typically wintry, snowy. Um, but that's a darn good. And, there, and now that we live in California, there's no reason not for, for people not to go calling on each yeah. other. Right. I like that. Right, right. I was talking with uh, – you, I'm sure I you... like the priest passed out on the floor, too. <laughs> you're, sure that, you're sure the black olives are the only reason he passed out? Well, I out? don't know. I mean, there was one. One of our uh, local priests, uh, Father Ben Bradshaw, he was a classically cha- trained chef before he went into the priesthood. And uh-huh. he's phenomenal. And he's hilarious. And he, his, uh, his, his idea of paradise, he says, is butter. He just he loves to cook. He's lobbying the Vatican for uh, for the canonization of Julia Child. It's it's just the you know his his telephone his phone case. It looks like a jar of Nutella. It's <laughs> great. So he's super Good. guy, super guy. And I'm sure if he, we could get him over here, he would eat until you know he wouldn't explode. But he'd probably pass out too. So. <laughs> I, I'm starting to like the I'm building up this mental image of the Carter household on Christmas Day. Oh, it's and people fun. Just, a flop house, literally. Right. <laughs> and when it gets to a glass of eggnog and make room for me on the floor. When it gets to be too much, I've got my study back here because I, I, I'm kind of an introvert and I can get drained quickly from these kinds of things. So I come on back here. And anybody's welcome to come back here, too. And we, I've, got a, I've got a little bar here in the office with me. It's my medicine cabinet. And uh, we'll we'll pass out the pharmaceuticals and enjoy the afternoon here if we need to. So, jeepers creepers! <laughs> I, I, I might turn up. Please do. I don't know if I can get there Christmas Day, but I might turn up that yeah. week. Yeah, it'll be it'll be fun. Um, it, I was talking with my buddy uh, Robert Lee, uh, another uh, retired Air Force guy, and we, he and I were talking earlier in a little interview about. Uh, Christmases in the past and being away from family and kind of commiserating the, that part of military yes. life. Did you ever go through any of that sort of thing where you had to be away from the family during Christmas? Away from the family during Christmas. When I was studying in England, yes. But those okay. were only a couple of Christmases. And I had close English friends. I had people who adopted okay. me for the day. Yeah. And uh, and that was nice. The, I remember one, one Christmas in particular in England. It was a very old-fashioned Christmas. And we ended up <laughs> they began with watching the Queen's Christmas address on television. Everybody gathered in front of the mm, television right. and they took it. I, I thought to an American, of course, I kept waiting for the joke. <laughs> this, this is so ridiculous. Yeah, Somebody's got to be right. either the Queen makes a joke or somebody watching her makes a joke. Benny Hill's in the not background. A, not a, sorry. Yeah, Benny Hill. Exactly. Not a bit of it. This was a serious and it was part of their Christmas ritual. And then we end up with a huge dinner, lovely dinner, and then a walk after dinner, and then the evening singing songs around the piano. That was a lovely Christmas. Oh, that is good. Uh, that, to me, would just be the, the perfect kind of arrangement, actually. Um, so looking forward to the new year, uh, I think my only – You said I was looking forward to the new year. No, I mean, as we look – as we turn toward the new year in our conversation. Given that we have no choice. Right. All right. It's, it's, it's inevitable, like, like death and taxes. Um, yes. My only resolution, I think, is just to get through our big New Year's Day blowout sale at the store I work at without needing either a therapist or a defense attorney. And that might <laughs> that might be overly optimistic in my case. How about you? Any any New Year's resolutions? Oh. You, is it too early to ask that you question? Know, I, I have – I'm really very good at making New Year's resolutions for other people. <laughs> if you want me to make some resolutions for you, we could have a little bit of a chat, and I'd right. come up with a list of things you need to do, Dave, to get yourself turned around. Well, I'd listen. But to, but to get me turned around, it's just the same damn list that it is year <laughs> after year. I need to lose weight. I need to exercise more. I need to be – more concentrated about getting work done early in the day because that's really the only shot you have at yeah. getting real work done at before the phone calls start and right. the emails and all of that. And um, I guess – and a more attentive father and a more loving husband and the usual, yeah. the usual. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I wish – this is the – now let's take this – take a moment and think this through. What – why do we find these resolutions so hard? Because they're too hard. Why don't we think of something simple, Dave? You and me, right now. Um, I, I, th- I I don't know. I think the I think the whole. I'm going to polish my shoes at least once a quarter. Okay. How's that? Maybe I could. It's a good with that start. 
That's a good start. Well, <laughs> but how, how do, what, no, no, that's the point. I think I'll just stick with that. <laughs> Uh, I mean, for, I mean for now, this let's year. check in and see if I, and I'll be more ambitious next in year. December 2020, I promise, if I can stick with that one. <laughs> I think when, I, when I was going to the gym all the time, the first two weeks of a new year were just hell to try to get to any weight equipment or anything. And right. then it, it kind of the crowd thinned out pretty quickly after that. So, Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. That's just – it's human nature. Yeah, yeah. That's why, that's why my goal is simply to get through New Year's Day. Without if having a picture know. in the paper you know at the I'll end do? of it, you know? I'll give up Brussels sprouts. That's easy. Those are, those are awful. I could, I could stick with that one. I can, too. That's I hate them. <laughs> Me, too. But yeah, Me my too. mom-in-law, she makes them, you know, but she has to put so much well, junk on them so they don't taste like what they are. And never That's mind. exactly right. Yeah. People say, don't you love Brussels sprouts? And the answer is the only circumstance under which I love Brussels sprouts is if there's so much other stuff on it, you can't taste the Brussels sprouts. <laughs> My son and I were at a party. This is a couple of years ago. And they, they served this star fruit or something. It's in the shape of a star, little slices of it. But it just tastes not just awful. It's god awful. And we were talking talking the next day uh, with my sister, you know, and she says, well, if you, if you use the right, you should dip it in something. And my son said, yeah, like a trash can. So, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of, kind of where I am with Brussels, Brussels sprouts. So, uh, Star fruit. Last, last question. Um, yep. What are your goals or your hopes uh, for Ricochet itself in the, in the coming year? Are we, we doing well or something in particular you want to see us press a little bit further on or what? Um. Well, you know, there too, Dave. As I have gotten older, my <laughs> ambitions have 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 come down to earth. If Ricochet can continue to soldier on and still be here a year from now, okay. uh, Rob Long and I started Ricochet thinking that we might be able to follow the example of Ariana Huffington and build this huge site and get rich. It was sheer foolish hmm. avarice. Now all we hope the thing does, Ricochet does, is produce enough of an income to cover its own darned expenses uh, so that we could we can just keep it going. So what do I hope for for Ricochet? I guess on the message side, with a place where people post, yeah. and, uh, and on the podcasting side, my hope would be that we have – continue to have civil, even friendly conversation – that it ranges over politics, but also talks a lot, talks some about culture. I think of Gary McVeigh and his wonderful posts mm -hmm. on movie history. I love that stuff. Yeah. I love it when people write posts about the books that they've read recently. And if if the it, well, we'll see. Of course, a huge amount depends on whether Donald Trump gets reelected or not. If he gets reelected, then of course he's the 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 main he'll he's the topic he's the figure yeah. he's the he's the top guy he's the but i hope i would hope that whether he departs in one year or five years ricochet is a place where people can begin thinking through what comes next right actually even if he gets reelected i'm not sure what his plans are for a second term and i'm not sure he's sure what his plans would be for a second term those fellows in the white house are going to need policy. Ricochet is a good place for thinking out loud about the future of the company in the company of people who are, broadly speaking, conservative. Mm -hmm. I say broadly speaking because Rob Long isn't as conservative as I am on a number of issues, but we can talk to each other. Sure. Right. So you, you can unbend your mind. You can think aloud in the presence of friends. That's what I hope for from Ricochet. On the podcasting side, I hope Dave Carter's audience quintuples. I hope <laughs> audiences – I think Ricochet is so wonderful that I hope more people discover us, discover our podcasts. That's That would be my hope for it. I'm just growth. <clears throat> just I'm growth. More ears. More people enjoying the podcast that Ricochet helps to produce and distribute. I'm with you 1,000 percent on that, obviously. I have, I have mad, <laughs> mad fun doing this. Well, Peter, I won't say sir. But Peter, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. And uh, thank Dave, you. as always, thank as you. always, thank you so much for coming over what here. What little voice time you out have! Here. I'm reminded of this. We don't, we don't do, we don't record together often enough. But you have such a good voice. This is my coffee voice. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Good 
Cajun, you know, some cafe au lait with the with the, uh, <laughs> the the chicory in it. Back home, he says, "Do you want you want some coffee? Yeah, just a small slice, please." So that's how that's how <laughs> that's how we do it. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Doggone. I want to go to that open house. I'll, I'll, step, I'll step over Father Martin yeah, to get back to please you, Dan, and, we'll, and I'll just have some chicory coffee laced with a little something. We'll do. I got, I, got, I got both the coffee and the something, so we can handle that. All Excellent. right. Well, this has been an honor as always, Peter. Thank you so much, man. It's been, and actually, this recording will be saved and heard. As opposed to the last one. So this will work out great. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thank you again, Peter. I appreciate it. And Merry Christmas, Dave. Merry Christmas to you, too. That, folks, that's Peter Robinson on the Dave Carter Program. Just hear those noses sniffling, sore throats tickling, too. <laughs> Come on, it's lousy weather to be suffering inside with the flu. <laughs> Outside the snow is falling, your fever's at a hundred and two. Let's take some Alka-Seltzer and a box of antihistamines, too. It's the Dave Garber Show. Sound like a little Christmas blues music there, don't it? Lord have mercy. Well, have you joined the fun over at Ricochet yet? I mean, let me talk to you just a minute here about, uh, well, limited resources. I mean, at Christmas time especially, we are reminded of all the limited resources. And the one resource that is necessarily limited is our time. Everybody has the same number of hours in a day, but we all have different competing interests that vie for that time. And buy for those hours. Well, if you want to stay informed and uh, get a little entertainment in the bargain, you don't have to look any further than right here on the Ricochet Audio Network. From best-selling author of Andrew Clavin Show to Law Talk with professors Richard Epstein and John Yu uh, and former President Bush speechwriter and really great guy Troy Sinek, over to former Secretary of Education Bill Bennett Show uh, to the flagship podcast where Peter Robinson, Rob Long, and James Wyatt talk to some of the most interesting and thoughtful people on the political scene today. I mean, you get to hear all, all kinds of interesting people like you just heard here today. Ricochet has over, well over 50 different podcasts that are sure to capture your interest. Now, here's the deal. If you want to interact with the podcasters themselves, well, for $4.50 a month, you can do exactly that. And not only that, but uh, for 4 dollars bucks, you can have total access to the website, comment and, and or interact with some truly brilliant pundits and commentators when they post their columns and uh, be to see what the members post on the on the uh, on the hidden side the members only side you'll be part of that but that ain't all y'all because check this out for 50 cents more a month five whole dollars you can write your own columns and essays and see them published on one of the most influential and widely read websites on the web ricochet is read in some of the highest offices in the land i mean ricochet is everywhere <laughs> which gives various movers and shakers a chance to read for themselves what normal people are thinking and what they're concerned about. It's not a bad deal, right? So brought yourself on over to ricochet.com to learn more about how you can be a part of this growing and dynamic community. That's ricochet.com slash join. Ricochet.com slash join, and you too can be part of the conversation. Think you're going? Nobody's leaving. Nobody's walking out on this fun, old-fashioned family Christmas. No, no, we're all in this together. This is a full-blown four-alarm holiday emergency here. We're gonna press on, and we're gonna have the hap hap happiest Christmas since Bing Crosby tap danced with Danny K. And when Santa squeezes his fat wine <laughs> down that chimney night, he's gonna find the jolliest bunch of holes <laughs> this side of the nut house. <laughs> It's Dave Carter on Ricochet. (laughs) 
So who knows, maybe Peter will wander into the Carter and Allen family Christmas extravaganza this year. I don't know. He wandered into our little show here today, which I think you'll agree was a wonderful experience. What a great guy. And yes, yes, Peter, he's a gentleman. And he's right, of course. Ultimately, we're all just a bunch of little old lusses, right? We're mortal. Titles, offices, resumes, I submit that ultimately they don't define us. It's how we treat those around us, how we treat those who serve our meals uh, in the restaurants, those who ring up our purchases in stores. Ultimately, how we react to circumstances and how we treat those who aren't in a position to do anything for us, our decency or lack thereof, says much more than our title or our position ever could, whether you're a mid-level manager or a senior manager, or even if you're the leader of the free world, is how you treat people that count. So you never know. When you take a moment and wish someone a Merry Christmas and you see that twinkle light up in their eyes, it's a good feeling, isn't it? And if this little program today has given you a smile, a moment of appreciation, or a well-deserved chuckle, then please accept that as my heartfelt wish to you and yours for the merriest of Christmases. With thanks to Rob Long, Peter Robinson, and my best friend, Bob Lee, and even my little loony friend, Alphonse Fontenot. But with special thanks to you, the listener, I'm Dave Carter for Ricochet.com, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the new year.